Watch this. A year before the primary, the race for Idaho's governor officially got more interesting, and the crowded challenge is coming from inside the GOP's own house. Governor Little isn't exactly stepping aside, though, which lays the groundwork for something that hasn't happened in Idaho in recent memory. It's been almost a full year since Idaho was in a statewide shutdown to curb the coronavirus. Well, some shutdowns actually helped some businesses reopen. With some COVID precautions now pushed aside, will wide open places like Boise's 8th Street return to pre-pandemic normal? It is official. The Idaho Republican primary for governor will feature the current governor and the current lieutenant governor. Earlier today, Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan announcing she is running for governor, hoping to take over that office on the second floor from Governor Brad Little. So here we go. The journey into next spring's primaries will be interesting. So let's start with today's announcement from Lieutenant Governor McGeehan. Joe Paris sitting at the Capitol right now following McKeon's words that she announced today in several places. What's the effort from McGeehan? What's it going to look like? How is she going to set herself apart from the rest of the candidates? Yeah, Brian, it, it looks like really what Lieutenant Governor McGeehan, outside of her conservative agenda, will be running on is her difference of opinion on how Governor Little handled the pandemic, really the last 18 months. Uh, she spoke to a crowd of about 100 people earlier today on the State House Capitol steps uh, about how she really didn't appreciate what she as she would say, the way that Governor Little handled things like essential workers or closing businesses or stay at home orders. She also mentioned things like masks, although there was no mandate here in the state of Idaho. Now, Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor McGeehan had a, a nice crowd here, I think you could call it today. On her second stop of three, she went on three different stops today, making the same announcement. She made a very similar speech here at the state capitol. She made this morning over on the other side of the state, declaring officially her candidacy for government saying that she believes that all employees are essential, that all businesses should stay open. She also talked about the relationship between the state of Idaho and the federal government. She criticized the governor's office on how federal aid was spent in terms of the coronavirus package. Uh, that's something that we've heard from lawmakers and other Republicans throughout the state of Idaho. They didn't think that Governor Little should have spent the money and allocated the money the way he did. We know that lawmakers thought they should have been called back to do that on the legislative end. Now, when you talk about the Republican candidates at the core of it, a lot of them really do agree on a large variety of conservative subjects. But I want to give you a little taste here of what Lieutenant Governor McGeehan is running on outside of her differences between uh, her and the, the current governor on the pandemic. Here's her platform. You need to know that your Lieutenant Governor has been working consistently to protect our individual rights, our state sovereignty and our traditional conservative values. I firmly believe in these principles, and I know you believe in them too. I am running for governor to restore the principles that have made Idaho great. Individual liberty, state sovereignty, and traditional conservative values. My proven experience shows that I will always defend these principles. And she also touched on her consistent record as an Idaho lawmaker, also touching on the fact that she put a term limit on herself when she was a state lawmaker, went back to the private sector. But she says the 2016 presidential run by President Donald Trump inspired her to get back into politics. Of course, that ended up with her being the lieutenant governor of the state of Idaho. You heard her talk about personal liberties, something that she talked about were personal rights as well as Second Amendment rights. She touted her her grade, as she called it, from the NRA being a top notch grade. She really touched upon the individual rights of Idahoans as well as traditional family values. Uh, Brian, as we get into the Republican primary, which will take place in about a year from now, May of 2022, we're going to hear a lot of different comments from people in the race about how they defer from each other. But I think most noticeably what we're going to see from the candidates is how they disagreed about the governor's handling on the pandemic. A lot of them will talk about traditional and family conservative values that they're running on. But I really think what will dif differentiate them is what happened over the last 16 months and how they really wanted to handle it differently than little. Uh, speaking of Governor Little, Joe, I think I want to make sure I want to clarify this. I want to make sure we're not prematurely putting him in this race. He's listed on the Secretary of State's website as a candidate for governor. But does that necessarily mean that he's running for the next for 2022? Can you add something to that? 
Yeah, Brian, I think it's important that we touch on this. Now, the Secretary of State site does include candidates for office as well as candidates that have currently been in office and kind of some of the expenditures that they've spent fundraising for that office. So Governor Little is on the Secretary of State's website, but if you look at some of the details that you need to pay attention to and I need to pay attention to is the date on exactly when things were filed. Um, officially, Governor Little's paperwork appears to not be in for the 2022 race. Um, I checked in with his campaign a short time ago about possible plans to run for governor again. You assume he would. You assume that it would be him versus the lieutenant governor um, as a top primary matchup next year, Brian. But it's, until that paperwork is filed and stamped, it's wait and see. And based on what he's put out on social media in the last couple of days, it doesn't seem like he's ready to kind of step aside just yet. All right, thank you very much, Joe. We'll watch for that filing of that paperwork. All right, well, she became Idaho's first female lieutenant governor two years ago. Now she's going for another gem state first. The first sitting lieutenant governor to unseat a sitting governor from the same political party, should Governor Brad Little run again. Considering the 14 months we just went through, a global pandemic that damaged our health and economy, the vocal opposition to how it was handled, the breakdown of the legislative process during this spring's record-breaking session, where the conflict over education budgets, social justice issues, and public health powers dragged it out to 120 days and even longer, even though it's predominantly Republican, well, this announcement today and this state of affairs within Idaho's GOP shouldn't shock anyone. Didn't surprise Boise State University political science professor Dr. Stephanie Witt either. But that doesn't change the rarity of this situation. Well, it seems to be relatively rare. Uh, there are cases of a lieutenant governor competing against a sitting governor, but that almost always in involves uh, people from the opposite party. So certainly this is the first time in many, many decades that we've seen this happen here in Idaho. So in your opinion, I mean, how do you classify this? It, what does this say about the direction of the Republican Party right now? Well, I think it says that, that there are competing factions within the Republican Party, and that's not unique to Idaho. That's a nationwide thing. Um, you know, we recently this week saw the National Republican Party in Congress uh, unseat um, uh, Representative Cheney from her leadership position, you know, because she uh, had parted ways with the uh, leadership about how to uh, uh, describe and characterize the uh, January 6th insurrection and the role of Trump in the party going forward. So I think I think there's you know some um, factions within the party nationally, and we're seeing kind of a miniature version of that here in Idaho. Normally, kind of interparty kind of fractions and divisions kind of kept in the back room sometimes. There has been no secret about the way Lieutenant Governor has felt about the governor, especially this last year. Is this the trend that we're going to see? I mean, does this surprise you? I, I kind of wish it did surprise me, but um, you know, the we're a long way away from the days of Ronald Reagan, who really insisted that Republicans never said anything bad about Republicans in public. You know, uh, clearly we're no longer in that kind of an era. Um, and, you know, I've seen that. Uh, at the national level, certainly, and um, we're seeing it here now. The lieutenant governor is not a shy person, it seems, and I'm sure she'll be an interesting candidate to watch and listen to. You know who's not stepping away from the Trump side of the Republican Party? Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan. You know, we still have a year to go before the Republican primary in May of 2022, as Joe mentioned. Dr. Witt says by declaring this early, McGeehan can garner more exposure and raise more money. The downside is that means more money will likely have to be spent just to win the primary. By all six candidates now running for governor, that is, again, including the current governor, if that happens, if all six of them uh, they're on the Republican side of the ticket. That's pulling a lot of people's votes in different directions, but there's going to be a lot of attention given to the top two names in this race, especially since, well, they will have to work together for the next year or so. That relationship likely won't change much considering how we got here. At the end of the day, we have to find common ground and we have to move forward, right? Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, uh, making sure that every voice is heard. But if people feel like they haven't been heard or they haven't been treated fairly, that's when it really you really struggle keeping people united. So I think that's where we're at right now. A struggle keeping people united. That's the state of the Republican Party right now in Idaho, apparently, according to Chairman Tom Luna. An assessment 
thanks to the pandemic that surfaced like the USS Dallas submarine in the hunt for red October it came straight out of the water. Remember that it was awesome, but also like that pimple that seems to slowly work its way out in the middle of your nose right before prom. This postule in the relationship between Idaho's governor and lieutenant governor we've seen coming for quite some time and there hasn't been any amount of clear that could clear it up. Why are you the lieutenant governor not supporting the governor? Um, well, first of all, I'm a cons duly elected constitutional officer yes. uh, elected by the people of Idaho. I report to the people of Idaho. Yeah. That doesn't mean that the governor and I agree on everything. And when we do disagree, I will speak my mind. That was back on April 28th, as the state of Idaho was still under a statewide stay at home order. It was about to be lifted days later. What seemed to be headed south, though, the relationship between the lieutenant governor and the governor, simply described as tense. It's a tense relationship right now. It I over a period of weeks. Yes, I was I have been involved in getting receiving daily updates from the governor's staff, but I've never been a part of of the decision making circle. My advice has never really been asked for. It's never sure. been taken. Over the next few weeks, McGeehan would participate in Liberate Idaho rallies, protesting the governor's four-phase reopening plan, even flying north in a flat-out defiance of the governor's directive to show support for a Kendrick brewery opening up on May 2nd, a month and a half before bars were supposed to. McGeehan also opened her own Celtic Pub and Grill in Idaho Falls, claiming it was a restaurant, not a bar. That was about the same time she penned an op-ed letter, criticizing Governor Little's mandate to close certain businesses during a health crisis saying, now more than ever, we're in a moment where political courage is mandated. We must not be afraid to stand up for all businesses, large and small, including all of those thousands of businesses without a voice or a paid lobbyist. She ended it with this jab. The governor campaigned on a promise of imposing the lightest hand of government on Idahoans. To me, this means getting out of the way and letting Idahoans get back to work. Well, how big was the divide between the two executive officers? The day after the lieutenant governor's letter, Governor Little admitted they hadn't spoken in three weeks. But by the fall, McGeehan was appointed to the governor's Coronavirus Financial Advisory Committee, helping to decide how to spend the more than billion dollars of federal money coming into Idaho. However, on September 15th, she skipped a committee meeting where they were supposed to decide what to do with $150 million of CARES Act cash. Instead, driving to Stanley to attend a rally with the president's son, tweeting out a picture before sending the committee an email minutes before that meeting was to begin. Her staff claimed she was absent because of personal reasons. We recognize that all of us are by nature free and equal and have certain inalienable But probably McGeehan's most infamous moment came in an Idaho Freedom Foundation video railing against coronavirus restrictions put in place by the governor. And pursuing happiness and securing safety. They went weeks without speaking to each other over the last 14 months. One has to wonder what those communications will play out, how they'll play out over the next 12. By the way, both Little and McGeehan won their respective positions back in 2018 with 60% of the general election votes. And whichever way this plays out, at least one of them will be ending their term in January 2023. Closing off the street to cars was meant to be a short-term solution to a pandemic problem, giving diners some space to keep their distance. Now there's a push to keep it permanent. You know what else isn't changing? Our want to connect with you. And it's super simple to do. Just type this number into your phone, 208-321-5614, and text us whatever questions, comments, or even criticisms you have about the show. But make sure to include your name in the hashtag the 208. We're going to pick some good ones to read and respond at the end of the show.
It's one of the busiest streets in downtown Boise and for nearly a year, 8th Street has been closed to vehicle traffic and open to pedestrians. In May of 2020, Boise City Council approved a resolution to close that street to give restaurants the opportunity to expand their patio seating all the way to the curb and in some places beyond a way to give more space for everyone to socially distance. Today, business is booming and according to a recent Bloomberg article, 8th Street eateries actually saw more customers when the street was well cut off to cars and strictly limited to pedestrians. It's based on a number of Yelp reviews and photos. So does the city plan to keep it this way? And what do business owners, 8th Street goers, think of this pedestrian only street? Katya Stepovic has the story. When they first suggested it, our thought was going to be this is going to be terrible for us. People are used to parking right in front of our store. Bruce Delaney, co-owner of Rediscovered Books on 8th Street, says even though his bookstore didn't extend business to the curb, he's been pleasantly surprised. In a lot of ways, this has been really good for us. People love being able to, to walk up and down the streets. And in the summer, you'll, in the summer evening, you'll see a street full of people where before you, you saw just people on the sidewalks. On Saturday at, at, at 5 o'clock, the street was full of people. And, and that is, is nothing but good for all of us as businesses. Morgan Dowdy, manager at Wild Root, agrees that the closed street has drawn more people in. Extending our patio has been wonderful. We're about to do some upgrades to our patio and uh, put up a little high top bar right here facing 8th Street for kind of people watching, which I think will also be great. There's going to be so much of that to do. I think people will want to sit at that. So it's definitely helped us maximize our capacity. 8th Street has always been one of our, our crowning jewels as a city downtown. But uh, what we've seen as we've been able to make this, um, this sort of experiment work um, is a place that's just consistently filled with, with uh, pedestrian traffic, um, people of all ages. Sean Keithley, Director of Economic Development for the City of Boise, says the emergency assistance program that allowed for the street closure was originally created to help local businesses through the pandemic. But now the desire to make it something permanent is growing. Businesses uh, have reported seeing some very positive numbers, uh, not only uh, against 2020 numbers um, and some of those worst months of the pandemic, but also looking back to 20, 2019 and comparing favorably to that. Keith Lee says the city of Boise hasn't made a decision to keep the street this way or return it back to one way traffic, but he says local leaders are listening closely to feedback from businesses and exploring some design considerations. I suspect that we're never going to go back to having it be an open street because I think the net positives so far outweigh the negatives. And visitors we spoke with would also like to see the pedestrian friendly corridor remain. As a mom with little kids, when we come downtown, it just gives that extra element of safety and it makes me want to bring my family here to eat and um, to go shopping and to walk downtown and just have that be one of our activities that we do as a family. It's delightful and I think it's a real asset to our community. I think it will make Boise more of a livable city in the long term. It's maximizing capacity, it's a big draw, it's very relaxing to be able to have a cocktail outside. We need more of that in downtown. Yeah. More cocktails in general. <laughs> Tough to argue with that one. Well, Katya, so 8th Street is usually a primary spot for the Saturday market in downtown. I got to figure that out as well, but have they talked about how long they plan on keeping 8th Street pedestrian only? Well, the ordinance that allows businesses to extend their services on the sidewalks is good until April of 2022. So unless Boise City Council decides to make any long term decisions until then, we can expect to see 8th Street stay pedestrian only. Brian. Yeah, we'll see how that plays out because they have kind of encroached on some of that market space. But again, a lot of that still has to be figured out. Thank you, Katya.
So Greater Idaho is getting, well, greater support, along with bonds and levy elections here in Idaho. Yesterday, across the border in Oregon, the initiative to join the state of Idaho to form a Greater Idaho was on the ballot in a handful of Oregon counties. Five of them said they wanted to join the Gem State, bringing the two-year total to seven. Voters in Sherman, Lake, Grant, Baker, and Malheur counties voted overwhelmingly in favor of becoming part of the Move Oregon border movement. Those other two from last year, Union and Jefferson counties, they voted to do it back in November. Now, these ballot measures are part of an overall effort to move the borders of Oregon and Idaho to what you kind of see on your screen right now. That would move 18 counties and parts of three others into Idaho, which is about 76% of the land in Oregon and 21% of the population. Organizers say they want to extend Idaho's jurisdiction over the conservative counties of eastern and southern Oregon. The ballot measures are supposed to, quote, put pressure on the state legislatures of Oregon and Idaho to negotiate an interstate compact to relocate their common border. But these initiatives, well, they weren't actually a vote to secede from Oregon just to get county leaders to either talk about it or promote the idea of Greater Idaho. So it's still a long way from happening. But guess what we were told could be coming to Idaho State House soon? Mike McCarter, the man behind the Move Oregon's Border campaign, says Idaho representatives Barbara Ehart and Judy Boyle plan to bring it up next session. But even that might be too early to celebrate because even if Idaho lawmakers were on board, federal approval would still need would still be needed. State constitutions would have to change something that hasn't happened in 50 years in the United States. But already seven of the 18 counties in Oregon have said yes. And next up, Douglas and Harney counties in November. All right, final minute of the show on this Wednesday, and we've got your comments. Doug would like to know from McCall, 
I wonder if McGeehan's lighter government hand would include allowing for the legalization of pot. I have a feeling that probably falls under the conservative values thing and probably not part of her campaign speech. Successful leaders have the acuity to comprehend a bigger picture and understand when a situation calls for some sacrifices of individual rights and conservative values in order to help their communities and the nation overcome a crisis, says David in Boise County. He doesn't believe Lieutenant Governor McGeehan has shown a potential for that. It's sad that we have, a cho have to choose between a mainstream Republican and a conspiracy theorist who flaked out on required meetings to chase Trump in Nevada, posting online her antics. Idaho didn't need this. Little did his job. Finally, on the closure of 8th Street and the potentially possible potential possibility of keeping it that way because it's pedestrian friendly. Love the story about keeping 8th Street closed. I love that idea. Let's add the Basque Block to the list. Make downtown as family friendly as possible, says Edu. The Basque Block, basically a walking place anyway, but that's a good idea. It seems to be a perfect spot if they want to expand that. We'll see you back here tomorrow.